start again. Welcome to the session of Strand 3, the crucial law of teachers focusing on teaching and learning resources and materials. Um, nobody will uh, deny that the te teachers are the center for the education and learning, and teaching and learning materials and resources are very important to support for the teachers. We are going to have a discussion on this very important matter, and we have a fabulous three presenters. I'm going to introduce them very briefly. Mm -hmm. First, Dennis, Dr. Dennis Signolo is the Africa Director of the Education International, the global organization of teachers. From 2006 to 2020, Dennis was a senior coordinator in charge of Education International's Education Employment and Research Unit at its headquarters in Brussels. Dennis has undertaken several studies on education and teachers, and he holds a doctorate in educational management from the University of South Africa. Next is uh, Mary. Mrs. Mary Sijangi is a specialist in mathematics education and a teacher trainer, a working in a government and a partner funded the projects and programs in Africa. Currently a PhD candidate in education University of Nairobi. Uh, she works at the Center for Mathematical, Mathematics Science and Technology Education in Africa, SMASTEA, based in Nairobi, um, Kenya, as a senior teacher trainer, a STEM education, and head of a partnership and linkage depart, depart, department, um, spearheading partnership arrangement and the continental uh, secretariat programs. Uh, last but not least, my dear colleague Tamachen. Dr. Tamachen Engida has a doctorate in STEM education from Germany. He currently works for the UNESCO International Institute for Capacity Building in Africa, ICBA, as a program officer for ICT and STEM education. In this capacity, he has been training uh, teacher educators and teachers in African countries in areas of e-learning, content development, and e-assessment, ICT enhanced teacher development, contextualizing curricula and instruction, ODLTI, and the UNESCO ICT competency framework for teachers. So, I'm going to ask, ask excuse me, a set of questions to these three fabulous panelists. <coughs> excuse me. So, I go first to Dennis. Dennis, um, please. You have about five minutes to respond to this question. What is the status of a teacher? <coughs> Excuse me. What is the status of teaching learning materials and resources in relation to ensuring sustainable development with a focus on Africa? How and what are the views by teachers? Please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, Yumiko. And first of all, thank you to UNESCO for inviting Education International to join this important conversation. As you can see on the slides, I have summarized a few challenges related to teaching and learning materials in Africa. First of all, we have the challenge of poor uh, infrastructure, whether you're talking about classrooms, whether you are talking actually about the availability or effective non-availability of libraries, laboratories, even housing for teachers. So there is a big challenge on that front. The example I've cited is coming from Africa Education Watch, where they launched a study last week indicating that in Ghana, for example, there are 5,403 schools under trees, sheds, or dilapidated structures. This is not unique to Ghana. Go to many African countries, you'll find children learning under, under trees you'll find children sitting on the floor because there is no furniture. Unfortunately, the use of substandard structures has resulted in many fatalities. In Niger, we've had many incidents of fires because the classrooms are actually made of grass and wood. Temporary structures, unfortunately, lives of children and sometimes teachers have been lost in that regard. So it's a serious, serious challenge. 
given the current situation of COVID-19, as you know, colleagues, many governments have tried to provide teaching and learning via distance education, digital platforms, and so on. Unfortunately, this has not been successful in Africa simply because of unavailability of digital infrastructure. For example, 89% of learners in Africa lack access to a house or computer, but also because teachers have not really been trained. They lack the skills to provide distance education, virtual teaching and learning. So we're talking about the challenge of the digital divide as a result of lack of digital infrastructure, but also lack of digital skills. There is also a shortage of contextually relevant teaching and learning resources. You can't imagine that there are countries which are using textbooks which are developed, designed, printed, and reflect the content and reality outside the country or even outside the continent. That becomes a problem. So it's one of the challenges of making sure that the curriculum as well as the teaching and learning materials reflect the local reality, including the relevant diversity that is found in each uh, specific country context. The issue of housing for teachers is of paramount importance. I did a study not so long ago looking at one of the reasons why we don't have, uh, generally speaking, female teachers in rural areas or teachers are moving from rural to urban areas or even to other countries. And one of the primary reasons is lack of teacher accommodation. We have many countries where teachers actually are given a school, but they're not given a house or even a room. You have to use your initiative, go to the local community and look for housing, look for a room to rent. So that becomes a challenge. But we have countries where actually a school is not complete unless it has housing for teachers. So that's what would be ideal. The next slide just reflects some of the realities in terms of visuals of what I've just talked about. That's the kind of school I'm talking about. On the left, children learning under a shed. And then that's the teacher accommodation that you see, that big hut there. Can you imagine what it does to the dignity of the teacher or students learning under trees and the unfortunate fires that have killed children in Niger and other places? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis, Dr. Dennis. That was a very um, good description of um, reality of teachers and teaching in some countries in Africa. Now, we go to the uh, second question to Mary, my colleague. What are the roles of uh, STEM and STEAM teacher, teaching and learning materials in attaining the sustainable development goals? In, the, in your opinion, how? Please, you have five minutes. Thank you, Dr. Yumiko. And uh, thank you, uh, UNESCO, for honoring me with this opportunity, even to discuss uh, the role of uh, STEM teaching and learning materials, especially in attaining sustainable development goals. Uh, maybe it becomes easier <clears throat> when I, I'm, I'm able to define what um, in my understanding, um, a STEM or a STEAM teaching and learning material, uh, because it will be easier now in subsequent explanations, the role. <clears throat> the role is determined from what a teaching and learning material plays in terms of communicating desired knowledge, skills, and attitudes for improved learning outcomes. In any endeavor, whenever you are teaching learners, the desire is to enhance uh, learning and therefore a resource could be physical or digital. Uh, so we look at teaching learning resources especially uh, from conventional point of view or from nature uh, because especially those from nature illustrate the real life scenarios of the applicability of um, that resource especially in the context of STEM education. And sometimes uh, the process of looking at nature, looking at a moving car, uh, looking at um, a, a, a machine that is making work easier will help me appreciate the culture of creativity around STEM education, innovation, and of course, conservation of specific artifacts that then 
uh, make our life very comfortable in 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 day to day use. So, a teaching learning resource in the same context is the enhances actually learners' understanding and the application of the concept that they have learned in real life. And so the role of a teaching resource in STEM is very important. It has to be well selected, deliberately designed for communicating knowledge, skills and attitudes. And as I say this, I'm drawing <clears throat> from my experience having been a teacher for many years, high school teacher teaching mathematics and science and how difficult it is for a teacher to walk to a class and communicate algebra, for instance, to learners, because algebra is a foreign word. Sometimes it does not even have a direct translation to the language that the children maybe are coming from. And so a teaching resource makes it very practical, linking what the learners already know, maybe from the environment, to the knowledge that the teacher is desiring to communicate. And subsequently, when learners have gone through a process of appreciating a concept and how it is um, transforming into a hands-on uh, resource, uh, then it becomes easier for them to understand even abstract concepts. And many times we have to think, uh, call it thinking outside the box, to consider what kind of resource can best communicate a given concept like trigonometry. Those are very, very, very heavy words or, or, or very strong terms that learners really don't see. But it's all talking about the three sides or a three-sided plane figure called a triangle. And it's just talking about solving a triangle and uh, maybe making use of that triangle in real life. And so if learners will come to learn that these are real life scenarios that they will come across and they will need to have understood how to solve them, then they graduate with, with, with STEM-based knowledge and skills and attitudes necessary for achieving sustainable development goals to improve the quality of livelihoods, both for themselves and even for other people that they're living in the society and the future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary. You made us realize that uh, a number of important issues. This material, teaching and learning materials and resources can be physical and digital. This is what we realized in the, in the COVID-19 school closure and so on. But um, also we learn uh, skills and attitudes from uh, the teachers. So when teachers are resourceful, that's what uh, children will learn. We go to uh, Tamachen. Um, Dr. Tamachen, uh, I understand that you have been working on ODLTI, Open Distance Learning for Teachers in Africa. And what are the roles of ODLTA and the instructional design in uh, ensuring the attainment of education for sustainable development? And then how are you doing it? Okay, over to you, you have five minutes. Thank you very much, Dr. Michael, uh, my director, and uh, thank you, the organizers, for, for this program. Uh, ODL in general, online and distance learning in general, is both an instructional approach as well as materials. Uh, for the learner to learn, there must be some teaching learning materials. Even the learner could be a teacher as well, but also it is designed in a very uh, different way from the physical or face-to-face -face modality of learning. So as such, it has the potential to address access to all. As long as the internet connection is there, uh, we can access uh, as many as possible teachers. And uh, in Africa particularly, this will be very important. And instructional design is a course design and development approach. And the intention is to develop through the instructional design approach to develop quality multimedia, digitally uh, sound, all online and distance learning. So it shifts the focus to learners in the sense that, for instance, in the ADE model, analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation, analysis focuses on analysis of the learning. Usually, when we are developing curriculum and writing textbooks, we were sitting in the offices and uh, you know copying and pasting materials but in the instructional design approach 
we analyze the learner and the context. And both Mary and Dennis have raised that contextualized materials are not available. So the intention of inserting instructional design into ODL is to contextualize and at the same time create a quality material. So designing quality instruction and making it available to all in need of the materials are key aspects of the sustainable development goals in terms of access as well as quality. Thank you very much. Back to you, Yumiko. Thank you very much, Tamachen. Uh, your response put all those uh, three together. Yes, it's very important for teaching learning materials to be contextualized. And uh, ODLTA and also your work has been uh, contributing to this one. Thank you very much. Now, I do believe we can open the floor for five minutes or so uh, to respond to some questions or comments from the floor. So please uh, raise your hand and then you can have a floor. Any questions? If not, we can ask uh, questions to each other. Maybe I will have a quick question to three of you. Do you have any uh, successful examples of teachers um, coming into the, teachers bringing uh, contextualized teaching learning materials in some of the countries you're working? Maybe uh, Tamachen? Yes, I can go okay. first. Okay, Mary, thank you. Over to you, Mary. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. We have teachers in countries that we work on STEM that have designed uh, uh, teaching learning resources, and I said both physical and digital, that are helping learners <clears throat> appreciate uh, science and mathematics is uh, doable. And I will give an example of Kenya and Ghana. We have teachers in Kenya here who have created um, digital resources that enable the learners to understand how electricity flows, for instance, digitally, what we call virtual labs and simulations. They are simulating the same uh, laboratories they have in their physical schools virtually, and they are able to teach lessons uh, using Zoom and the other synchronous and the asynchronous media platforms using these resources. And it becomes very easy for learners to see that um, electricity flows through electrons. Something that you can't teach in a physical setup. Sometimes it's not even possible to explain how electricity is flowing to create a bulb and it, I mean, to, 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 to bring out light through a bulb. But they are able to simulate the same. In Ghana, I have also seen some physical materials that they have designed, e.g. the human body. There are parts of the body that you can hardly explain, but you find them designing from locally available materials to illustrate the human body and other parts of the body that are not necessarily visible, like the kidney and others. And children really get excited about this. Yeah. And they enjoy learning. So demystifying the idea that they are not teaching learning resources, yes, but it's possible to do what we call innovative improvisation. Innovative improvisation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Yes, I do remember when we did the STEM education for girls, many teachers brought the materials they made and then it almost brought the healthy competition. But, and then uh, demystifying and then using a locally available resources, that really is close to contextualization and also children will be learning by being creative and both teachers and the, and the learners. And uh, this, is a, this was a great fun. So thank you very much for this excellent uh, example. I still don't see any um, questions. So shall we go this uh, successful examples? Um, maybe uh, Tamachen or Denis, would you like to share with us one or two examples? 
Yes, okay. we have examples in Education International. I'll cite uh, two very concrete examples. One is what we call the book writing project, which we are doing in uh, Africa. Uh, for example, in Benin, Burundi, Burkina Faso, the Gambia, and Tanzania, and other countries, we brought teachers together through an intensive training program of two to three weeks on how to write reading materials for students. Then the teachers have gone on to write those materials. They contextualize, they tell the stories from the community, even the folklore that has been passed from generation to generation. So children um, enjoy reading these materials because they talk about the places they know, the rivers, the mountains, uh, the cities, etc. It has been a very, very good and successful project. It's ongoing in uh, most of the countries I've just mentioned, or it has been completed. The second example is uh, where we are working with teachers in early childhood education. It's part of the training program, capacity building program we have, which we call learning through play, learning through play in Benin, Kenya, Nigeria, Tanzania, Zambia, and other countries were brought together early childhood educators to develop materials, teaching and learning materials, including, for example, toys, dolls, etc., which they use to facilitate learning in early childhood education. They're also taught to use the environment, for example, using trees, grass, etc., open spaces to support uh, learning in early childhood education. And it has been found to be very effective. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's also an excellent way of contextualizing that the uh, folklores and so on will be written in simple language. That's an excellent way of uh, even uh, uh, enhancing literacy and also to learn their own culture and the history. That's beautiful. Tama Chen, uh, your turn. Yes, thank you, Yumiko. Uh, uh, yes, we have also, like for instance, as you know, through the HNA project, we're training uh, teacher educators in Ghana and Ethiopia uh, in order to produce ODL materials through the instructional design approach. And one of the intentions was for them to develop contextualized materials. For instance, in Ghana, they wanted to create a kind of clean campus or a college compound, uh, and they wanted to teach the climate effect, uh, the climate change effects and uh, other pollutions to their students. But at the same time, they developed the materials through the online and distance technology enhanced one. In Ethiopia, they raised a contextualized problem of like water hygiene, which is uh, affecting Tana Lake uh, very much. And uh, people are trying to, to, to remove that weed with physical as well as etc. kind of things, but the teacher educators wanted to raise the awareness of the pre-service teachers as well as the, their knowledge toward solving these kinds of problems through the educational program. So the online and distance learning and instructional design has also been producing such uh, good examples. Thank you. Thank you very much. So again, uh, bringing the programs that the teachers and children can see themselves would uh, be problem solving. And then also it is um, promoting the thinking. And that's a, also a very beautiful um, uh, area. And then which goes from primary school to universities. Um, I have seen in the Deborah, uh, Bahardari University a lot of uh, um, students who are interested in how to deal with uh, water hyacinths. So that is great. Okay, we go to the second set of our, our questions, which is key challenges and prospects. Key challenges and prospects. So Dr. Dennis, what are the key challenges and the prospects um, that teachers have in the effective use of teaching learning materials and resources? Over to you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yumiko. Let me step back and uh, look at the challenges. I have already shared just briefly some of the prospects, but going back to the challenges, I mentioned earlier on the challenge of not having 
appropriate infrastructure to support teachers to deliver effective teaching and learning through distance education, for example. So that is a serious challenge. The challenge of lack of skills or support mechanisms for professional development so that teachers can be able to deliver virtual teaching and learning. But there is another challenge which is quite common, unfortunately, in Africa. Um, not everywhere, but in some countries or some schools scripted lesson plans where lesson plans made for example in the united states or elsewhere are given to teachers to say you just read from the script through a tablet that's how you're going to teach that's terrible because one it takes away the teacher's initiative the teacher's autonomy and children are not machines where you can just stand in front of them expect the same response everywhere these are human beings you have to respond to their individual needs including their feelings. So it's a big problem. Sometimes we go too far to try and control the teacher instead of empowering, supporting the teacher and trusting the teacher to up actually be able to deliver effective teaching using locally relevant and contextualized materials. But the other challenge actually is that teachers are often excluded, which is surprising, from decisions related to the curriculum. Sometimes it includes actually the selection of textbooks. Can you believe it? Someone else decides which textbooks should be used and gives it to the teacher. This is the textbook you are going to use. It's important that we tap on the experiences of teachers, their expertise by involving them in coming up with um, the appropriate textbooks, empower them to write them if they can but certainly give them the opportunity to select textbooks teaching and learning materials that is of fundamental importance yes the prospects is what i've just uh, highlighted previously you can see that on the slide the examples um, i gave of us working with teachers to support them to be able to write materials we need to continue doing exactly that we need to continue listening to them we need to continue supporting them, ensuring that they have the autonomy, the initiative to actually focus on problem solving, creativity and so on. And that can only happen not through controlling, not through scripted lesson plans, but through trust and continuous professional development and support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise. Music to my ears. And then many people say, yes, I believe that the uh, teachers must be trusted, respected, and also recognized as the professionals. And then also they should never be excluded from the decisions, but um, vital decisions in education policy and uh, education. But it is always happening. I know I was a teacher and I got really frustrated. So we go to the next question to Mary. Um, what are the key challenges and the prospects in the effective use of uh, STEM and the STEAM teaching and learning materials and resources? Can you explain to us in five minutes or so? Over to you, Mary san. Mary, can you hear me? Hello? Hello. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Yumiko, once more. Uh, on the question of the key challenges and prospects. Yes. Um, hello. Yes, we can hear you very hello. well. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Hello. Uh, All right. Yes, yes, we can hear you. On the, yes, on the, on the question of the key challenges and prospects, um, thank you. Thank you for confirming uh, that you can hear me. On the question of the key challenges and prospects in effective use of STEM or STEAM teaching learning materials and resources, I have the following actually to say. Um, when teachers graduate from universities, I think when they come into the school environment, they never for one may be expected that they will not find conventional teaching and learning resources. 
And so they come to the school expecting that there are conventional resources for teaching STEM subjects. And so that's the first challenge, the expectation of the teacher versus what they find in the school environment. And of course, generally in all the educational institutions. And so the first challenge is now how to learn on the job to innovatively design and use teaching learning resources and in addition to physical, the digital resources. So effective use becomes a challenge at that point because first of all, you have to learn how to develop, you have to learn how to use, and then you have to learn to integrate that resource effectively in a lesson. So that's the greatest challenge that we encounter. And of course, uh, within the school environment, sometimes you come across schools where they do not necessarily have even the locally available resources to think about. So even when you're talking about them uh, being able to innovate or maybe um, uh, substitute for conventional, it becomes a challenge. And the second challenge here also is the inadequacy of the conventional resources, which I've already talked about. Um, in terms of teaching uh, STEM subjects, many schools, many educational institutions are not quite equipped with the laboratories. Or if they have the laboratories, maybe they have very little in those laboratories. And sometimes the focus is not necessarily in equipping the schools with those resources. And so the teacher has to struggle and work out how else to engage the institutions to appreciate the role of STEM resources. The other challenge is inability to create communities of practice among the educators in neighboring, let's say neighboring education institutions, and even the parents to agree to support teaching of these subjects by sourcing, sourcing uh, resources that can help teachers uh, teach this subject. So the question of uh, collaborative design, collaborative uh, sourcing, collaborative utilization, prioritization, and then of course uh, the issue of effective utilization is always a challenge in most of these schools. I, on the other hand, you can find some schools well equipped, but they are not again effective, effectively using them simply because of the pedagogical knowledge of using these resources. What are the prospects then of these uh, resources? I believe in continuous professional development. A teacher is made in the classroom. They can come from universities or educators can come from universities with all the theories of teaching and learning. But unless they are supported at school level, what we call pedagogical leadership, to translate those theories and also feel welcome to the in sometimes hostile environment, like uh, Danny said, within the education sector for them to comfortably fit in and uh, retool themselves on how to creatively come up with resources for teaching STEM subjects. And that is why we have very low interest in these subjects because students end up thinking that these are quite abstract uh, subjects that uh, cannot be understood. When you're telling a student that electricity is flowing in this wire, they have no idea what you're saying unless you use a simulation of sorts. And of course, the other prospect is the school policy. Very important, the school level policy to translate pedagogical leadership and provide support to the teacher for them to revitalize the practice of innovatively sourcing resources can actually be uh, a very important uh, potential way of uh, solving this. And institutionalizing science fairs and innovations for learners to actually come up with the resources that uh, can be also used in teaching can be a very effective way. Like I normally see in several countries, I've seen this a lot in Kenya, uh, the resources that learners come up with, find their way to the classroom and the teachers are able to use them. And uh, today in this country, we are talking about a STEM museum. We are in the process of establishing a STEM museum. Why are we establishing this? For us to document and also store and curate uh, teaching and learning resources that teachers have innovatively uh, developed from the local environment. And this is another way of helping teachers to learn from each other, to achieve the idea of communities of practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary, um, for narrating the challenges of which are um, physical infrastructure, uh, connectivity, and so on. 
but you also um, provided the um, uh, solution, continuous professional uh, development for teachers, which resonates what, with what Dennis has said earlier. And then uh, also uh, school policy is terribly important. Yes, so we go to the uh, third panelist, the Tamachan, uh, on the challenges and the prospects. What are the key challenges and the prospects in the development and use of uh, open distance learning and teaching learning materials and resources in this respect? Over to you, Tamachan. Thank you, thank you, Emiko. Uh, yes, uh, the challenges are many, but I tried to summarize them in the following way. Uh, in fact, as has already been said, online and distance learning uh, requires internet connectivity. Of course, there are uh, offline options as well, but in most cases, at least once, somebody has to be connected to download those offline materials. Like in our ODLTA, we have PDF, we have PPT, PowerPoint presentations, ex audio, etc., etc. So access to internet and electricity will be a very big challenge when you are going digital and online. Lack of social face-to-face -face contact among learners. You know, I have seen this with my children. When the school was closed and they were learning through Telegram and these social media things, they lost the peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, the peer uh, uh, relationship. And every play has become with, with this uh, laptop and uh, uh, smartphone. So that social aspect will also be uh, a bit challenged, but uh, through the community of practice and other uh, initiatives, but that aspect can also be a little bit handled. And teachers' skills in the design of quality of instruction. For instance, Dennis said that uh, scripted plans and the materials are given. And ICBAS approach is to, to empower the teachers in how to design those quality materials, including lesson plans, rather than you, they, yeah, they might read other materials. We are global, we are in the globe and the, the globalized world. But at the same time, the teachers for their own contexts should have the skills in the design of quality instruction. Another challenge is teachers' digital skills. For instance, when the, the pandemic erupted, uh, everybody was online and ICBA recognized that uh, teachers' skills in online and distance learning will be a very big challenge. So we produced a kind of uh, introductory course in what ODL is and what kind of tools can be used for ODL, what kind of pedagogies you can use in ODL, et cetera. So the teachers' skills are very, uh, the digital skills are very important. And the prospects are flourishing uh, of mostly free online quality materials. For instance, UNESCO through the Global Teacher Campus has been bringing many partners who have uh, developed and tested uh, quality materials like Profutro, Blackboard, ICBA itself through so the GPE project for our five Anglophone countries, uh, again for ECOWAS, the 15 countries for TV teachers and TV personnel and radio personnel, etc. And another one is capacity building initiatives, which ICBA is into. Uh, we have been doing this. Uh, in the TV and the radio program, for instance, for the 15 uh, countries, we included a basic computer skills because most of the teachers on the, in the field might not have touched computer at all. So there is a need to accommodate uh, and to address that aspect. And also, of course, go into the advanced 21st century skills and digital skills. And government's engagement, particularly since the start of the pandemic, and we have seen many requests from governments because the schools are closed and this digital online uh, distance learning has become uh, a kind of uh, current solution for, for their challenges. So if governments are engaged, in fact, the project-based approach would be avoided and uh, government's ownership will, will take place. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tamachan, uh, for um, again uh, stressing the number of challenges, access to internet, even electricity, and also the social aspect are very uh, are lost during the COVID-19. Indeed, that was a challenge, and that made us realize a lot of uh, um, a lot of challenges. 
but at the same time made us realize some of the uh, prospects and opportunities. Here is a question from the audience and maybe it goes directly to Mary, but uh, um, please three of you can uh, discuss. How do you measure STEM uptake in schools to be a success when subjects are being taught in silo, I mean, subject wise? Is that okay? How do you measure STEM uptake in schools to be a success when subjects are being taught in silo, subject wise? I suppose like a physics, uh, a mathematics and physics and chemistry, biology and so on. Over to you, Mary. Thank you so much for that question. Um, obviously, we have a long way to help teachers practice interdisciplinary teaching of STEM subjects. It's a new phenomenon. And of course, the culture of teaching maths and the three sciences as separate entities is well entrenched. A few hours ago, we have just released a study on the status of STEM education in Africa, which I was presenting the findings. And one of the issues we see are the pedagogical practices are still those that uh, focus learners basically on maths and the three sciences. And one of the issues we have also found out is that technology and engineering at basic learning level, it's also left out. I don't think they understand that the various technical and engineering subjects taught at the basic learning level are part of STEM. So this particular study we have just released is to help lay a very good foundation of developing STEM education in Africa. We have unpacked what subjects can be classified as STEM in Africa. We have found out about 40 subjects being taught in various countries in Africa. And most of those countries, when you ask them, is this a STEM subject? They say no, because they're not quite sure. So again, we are now just laying a basis for developing STEM by explaining uh, to member countries in Africa that uh, these are the subjects we consider STEM. Now, after doing that, the next level will be educating the educators on how then to do interdisciplinary teaching of the subject. So in terms of uptake, I have just released a study and uh, some of my colleagues here were there. We are still underdeveloped in terms of STEM education. Access is still low, participation is still low and success is still low. So we can't talk of any other, other finding other than what you're saying. And the question of how we measure that uptake, I think I've explained in many words that the uptake is still low. The understanding of interdisciplinary is still uh, not clear just by the way we ask questions and they tell us, oh, this is, this is a subject that is referred to as STEM when they're talking about maths, chemistry, physics, and biology, and they forget technology and engineering. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary, for uh, making us realize, and then also referring to your recent study, which I keenly uh, listened to uh, today in the African Union. You are absolutely right. Uh, interdisciplinary um, enrichment of STEM subjects will bring like architecture, carpentry, even fashion designing is very much STEM, but we don't realize, we think it is a, a very boring, excuse me, I used to be a, a science teacher as well, science and mathematics. Uh, any uh, quick um, intervention from the gentleman? Okay, maybe uh, I can add some. Yes, I also attended Mary's presentation this morning, and uh, uh, as she said, we are we are we are just starting, and uh, disciplinary based uh, subject based curriculum is is not a good fit to STEM program because uh, um, there must be some kind of curriculum reform. Otherwise, the currently STEM activities are offered in STEM centers in many African countries. It's like as a co-curricular activity rather than being part of the curriculum. So in the future, there is a need to 
to progressively go not only interdisciplinary, but also the integrated STEM curriculum. In order to address this situation, UNESCO ICPA, through the Global Partnership for Education Project for ECOWAS, we produced uh, seven subject modules, for instance, the yeah, ICT enhanced biology teaching, chemistry teaching, physics teaching, math teaching, etc., etc. And then we also developed ICT enhanced STEM teaching so that, so that the actual teachers in the school could somehow uh, exercise those kinds of approach and ultimately uh, governments can take up those uh, uh, preliminary results and probably engage in curriculum reform and introduce STEM in the curriculum. Otherwise, by having a look at the different subjects, uh, measuring STEM might be a very difficult one, but as a project, it can be measured. If teachers introduce, uh, give some STEM lessons or projects or problems in the physics, in the chemistry, in the maths uh, curriculum, or if they are even more uh, engaged, uh, they can they can they can use a team-based approach. The three or four subject teachers could come together and give one problem-based or inquiry-based program, and that can be measured. But with a traditional subject-based one, we measure only the subject. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Tamachan. I think I have to go to the next segment, which is very interesting, policy recommendations. So I think we, we are going uh, straight into that. It's very important segment. So, Dr. Dennis, please, is there any recommendation for policymakers uh, by way of the effective and efficient use of teaching, learning materials and resources? You must have a lot because you are standing in for teachers. Over to you, Dennis. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yumiko. Um, yes, uh, definitely. But if you may allow me to say, um, one of the most important things addressing the, the question which colleagues responded to is the application of knowledge. Quite often we present theoretical knowledge to children. They should be given an opportunity to apply it to solve problems in their environment, whether it is pollution or whether it is scarcity of something that can enable you to use different subjects I mean, subject areas at the same time to solve that practical problem. Project learning can really help. Now, coming to the specific area of recommendations, as you can see on this slide, I have summarized them to four. There are many, but these are the four uh, key ones I would like to leave governments and partners with. Number one, governments and partners should ensure digital inclusion. That's very important. We need to close the digital divide between African countries and the rest of the world. We need to invest, we need to invest in basic and support digital infrastructure, such as computers, wider internet coverage and electrification programs, because the support infrastructure is also a challenge in many African countries. But related to that, it's important for the African Union in particular to regulate data costs. They are very high, certainly for governments at national level. We need to regulate that industry in terms of the costs. The European Union did it in a certain way, in a small way perhaps. So I'm sure that the African Union can do it. And then it's also important, which is the second recommendation for governments and development part partners to invest in basic school infrastructure. I gave examples of many instances where there are no standard classrooms, no furniture for children, even libraries, laboratories, where teachers have no houses. It's important that we invest in infrastructure. And then number three, governments and partners should ensure that teachers are trained. This is fundamental. So we should invest in teacher education, initial teacher education, induction into the profession and continuous professional development so that there is lifelong and life wide learning for teachers. This is fundamental. Otherwise, without investing in teachers, there is no way we can improve the quality of our education systems. And let's not forget about school leaders. They are also fundamental if our schools are to be inclusive, equitable 
and of the best quality. And finally, it's important to ensure that teachers and their unions are involved in education policy right from the time of understanding what the problem is, conceptualizing different options for addressing the problem, developing the policy response, implementing it, monitoring it, and evaluating it throughout the whole process. And certainly, when it comes to the curriculum, including the selection of teaching and learning materials, textbooks, and so on, it's important to involve teachers. Let's support them actually to write those materials, to develop them, to publish them. In the project I just cited, uh, cited Dr. Yumiko, we are supporting governments, but sometimes you see heavy taxes are put on those materials, which are written by teachers for their schools, and it becomes a barrier. So would urge governments where there are such initiatives to support them because they are meant to help children, disadvantaged children, in, mainly in rural communities. But otherwise, I see great prospects for us to improve as long as there is political will and commitment. EI in Africa will just be launching a study on school infrastructure. We will actually publish the results next year. This will give us a comprehensive overview of how teachers feel about availability or non-availability of infrastructure in schools and education institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dennis. This was a very, very uh, comprehensive uh, policy recommendation, lifelong and life-wide uh, learning for teachers and uh, all the um, policies. Excellent. And, and we really look forward to your study on school infrastructure. Now, uh, Mary, please share with us any recommendation for STEM or STEAM policy makers and the practitioners by way of the effective and efficient use of teaching, learning materials and resources. Over to Thank you. you Thank you, Dr. Yumiko, once more. Um, some of the recommendations I'm going to make here in order to influence effective and efficient use of STEM-based teaching learning resources is a need for an all-inclusive policy and plan. Uh, because I work a lot in the environment of developing policies in Africa around STEM, um, I hear a lot, um, a lot of information coming through that most of the policies that influence, for instance, uh, STEM or math and science or any other education aspect are bottom, are top down. And when they are top down, the implementers feel that they were not involved, even when the policy is very relevant. So when we are designing policies, we need to be very deliberate about how then we take cognizance of the voices bottom up. And you, you noted that in our release of our report today, we were trying to achieve that. When we conducted the study, it would have been very easy to go to the minister's forum, come up with a policy and send it to the countries in Africa and tell them, please implement this because this is the status of STEM education in Africa. Contrary to that, we decided to change strategy and ask them, what do you think? What should we do? Do you think this is what is reality on the ground? And we involved some of the country representatives, I'm sure you saw, there were some who come into this meeting as rapporteurs and even as moderators, trying to get them involved to own, so that they don't come to a meeting maybe seated in some corner of the continent and you are reading the, the report and telling them, these are the recommendations, go and implement them. There should be elaborate policies and plans that support resource mobilization, utilization and institutionalization. Ownership starts with involving them. Otherwise, they will not institutionalize. They're very beautiful policies that are lying in ministries of education and they are sent to departments or to, 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 to counties and they have been kept on the shelves and don't, they, they, they don't believe that they need to implement them. And that is why I talked about school level policy. Does the school understand that they have a role to play in resource mobilization, utilization, and institutionalization, or they are waiting for the government to supply the resources? And that is why you go to schools and say the government has not provided. 
The second recommendation is to monitor and motivate. You know, we are all human beings and uh, we love to work in a good environment. My colleagues talked about the work environment. Having been a teacher, I always felt that I was bring, being brought law. I'm a graduate. You go to a school and it's so dilapidated. You go to the laboratory, and the last time you saw the paint is when the building was constructed. I mean, there were chemicals there, they are spilled all over the place, and that is why you find gender disparities in STEM education. Ladies are not very comfortable with some of the environments that are exposed to. And so it took a lot of courage for me to teach chemistry in high school for 10 years. It took a lot of courage for me to think outside the box and, and appreciate that indeed. So monitoring what the teacher is doing, supporting them and motivating them and thinking about their working environment in STEM education is very, very important. The third recommendation is to establish model STEM schools with the requisite resources to help cascade the same knowledge to other schools. Because we are talking STEM, we are seated here talking about STEM. How does STEM uh, look like? How does a STEM uh, uh, well-equipped school look like? What, what, what does that model STEM or STEAM school look like? Do we know? Does the implementer know? Do we prioritize resources for this? Do we sensitize people to know what that kind of STEM environment looks like? And, and that is why, uh, moderator, this is the most exciting part of this session. The next um, recommendation I will make is uh, capacity development. I think I've alluded to this quite early. Managers, school managers and teachers, do they understand? Remember, not all managers are science-based. And so we are expecting so much from them to provide uh, requisite resources to teach them education. First of all, they may have inherent attitude that they may have carried into this area and uh, they have found themselves in leadership. And I don't think their school development plan, I think in one of the, in, in my, one of my findings in the report, I brought out about, I brought out this fact of STEM development plans which school managers or education managers are running. You, you realize that when you look at those documents, we analyzed quite a number from uh, 10 African, uh, sorry, eight African, country, African countries, and you don't find much about STEM. STEM is just mentioned as a by the way. And so what will happen when they are allocating financial resources to equip? It will be very tricky because they will not have prioritized it as an important strategic objective in their school development plan. So resources for STEM will actually be among those which will not be given priority. And lastly, community and parent involvement is very key because these children are a product of their communities. Schools are products of their communities. And if, if, if we go by what Kenya is implementing, Kenya is implementing the competence-based curriculum. And when you look at the media today, they're talking quite a lot about how parents are complaining that uh, the, the teachers now are sending children home with homework that should be done within the home environment, e.g. maybe cooking, if they have learned home science, then the, the parent is, is expected to work with the child to practice the knowledge they learned in the kitchen. And the parents are complaining, they're saying, we're not used to this. We're used to children coming back, they put them in a corner, they do their homework, and it's taken to school the following day. But we are insisting that this has to happen. Through the competence-based curriculum, we're saying this has to happen. And that is why, now homework is being done between the child and the parents. And of course, it is going to take time to take root. Communities of expert practice is my last point. Sorry, moderator, may take slightly longer, but apologies, I'm finishing. Communities of expert practice is very important in resource mobilization. It takes time to innovate a teaching learning resource. So if I've developed a teaching re learning resource and I have my colleague teacher, Temechan, in a neighboring school, why should Temechan create the same resource? And she, he or she, he is teaching the same subject. We should actually collaboratively make exchange use of these resources and if possible, create this museum I'm talking about, a museum where we curate a teaching learning resources for STEM and they are kept safely for use for a cluster or even a region or even a county so that we don't have schools isolated and struggling with meager resources and yet there is a resource in the school neighboring. And of course, this goes without saying digital resources. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marison, uh, for your excellent uh, remarks. Yes, indeed, I agree with 
you all the policy uh, recommendations. Now, um, I go straight to Tamachen. Uh, Tamachen, please uh, share with us your recommendation for curriculum developers, policymakers, and practitioners by way of the development and the use of open distance learning materials using ID processes. Please, you have five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Emiko. Uh, I share many of the things that have been raised, but I have identified some four which are uh, also linked to my colleague's presentation. Uh, you know, uh, I am from UNESCO ICWA, where we, we are engaged in capacity building uh, based on projects. When projects are uh, finished, <laughs> usually, the ownership by member states is missing. So sustaining capacity building initiatives and taking ownership is the member states policymakers' uh, responsibility. In fact, in this regard, uh, the teacher project, we brought ministry people into the, the training so that they can coordinate from the national ministry the, the involvement of state teaching and girls in state kind of thing. So this ownership is a very important uh, thing to be taken. And large scale development and implementation of ODL through the ID process, at least in the TTCs. Again, it's linked to the sustainability because we are just practicing, we are just testing now in one college. Uh, for instance, if you go to uh, Nigeria, you can imagine how many teachers they have, but through the GP project, we are going to train only 1,000 teachers. So it is the member states' responsibility to have a large scale development and implementation of ODL, at least in the TTCs and universities, because the TTCs and universities have the multiplying power. They can, they can train at least pre-service teachers, also in-service teachers. Partnership with tech companies and working towards zero rate internet access for digital purposes is also very important because in the digital world, uh, in many African countries, the internet cost, including the power, electric power, is very high. So for educational purposes, member state, uh, partners uh, could work with the governments or governments could mobilize the partners in working in those countries like uh, bilateral partners and multilateral partners and tech companies in order to address those kinds of things and explore innovative ways of addressing access to ODL materials such as the use of solar power solutions. You know, internet is becoming costly and uh, Africa, in most parts of Africa, there is a whole month of the whole year of uh, sun power. Uh, so utilizing those kinds of things is a, should be government's priority. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Tamachan, for being a very precise and concise. There was a um, question from the audience on involving a parents and parents, but I think this question was uh, very well um, responded by Mary. When the um, children come come back home with a uh, homework, I think a parent can involve and then learn together. This is something that the UNESCO uh, advocates, learning society. So it becomes not only the learning child, but learning parents, learning family and learning community. And then the teaching learning materials and also STEM can bring this happening. So. I think we are coming to the end of this very, very exciting uh, session. Um, I didn't even uh, uh, introduce myself in the beginning. My name is Yumiko. I work for UNESCO's International Institute for Capacity Building in Africa, which is a UNESCO's Category 1 Institute for a Teacher Development in Africa. So this session was supposed to be uh, for global, but we deliberately chose Africa because that's where major challenges are, but major opportunities are. We had three fabulous uh, panelists from uh, Education International, Smastea and ICBA, to uh, share a very rich and analytical experience and recommendations. 
I was very excited to hear and then stimulated by this excellent um, conversation. And I hope this was true for many participants who are with us uh, through YouTube. Now, the session was uh, focusing on Africa, but I think issues are universal. And uh, I'm sure uh, the audience from other continents also had felt, yes, that is very true. Yes, challenges are many. Infrastructure, um, physical and also digital challenges, electricity, but the opportunities are many. We can use the clean energy, green energy in Africa. I live in Addis Ababa, uh, capital of Africa, where we call ourselves a city or a country of 13 months of sunshine. We have a 13 months. And uh, most of the year is with the sunshine. Therefore, we can make use of the solar energy. That is really um, part of our responsibility for the 21st and 22nd century. Now, COVID-19 made us realize that the teaching, learning materials and resources are not only physical, but digital. And that makes us share even uh, uh, across the border. We can imagine that uh, reading materials in Cote d'Ivoire might be read in Ghana and they can learn the similarities, but also they can learn in different languages. Anglophone countries can read the Francophone countries are textbooks and then learn and vice versa. So they made us realize that teaching and learning materials are not only physical materials. Of course, they are important and we have to continue development, developing them, but also digital materials are very important. And uh, parents and the community involvement is vital for this, much more so when uh, schools are, are closed or schools have to make um, um, different uh, arrangements for uh, COVID-19. And the most important resources in um, teaching and learning is of course teachers. And it was a, like a beautiful chorus. All three panelists talked about the teacher's involvement. Often, so often, that the teachers are out of the policy making and the policy implementation. But the teachers know the schools and the children and the teaching and learning materials better than anybody. So teachers must be involved. Teachers must be respected. Their voices must be heard and integrated into policy and implementation. And finally, when these things are done, we have an innovation and we have a relevance and a quality teaching and learning, which is the best gift for us, old generation, to the ge new generations in Africa and beyond. So thank you very much. I don't think I have uh, said everything. So I'm going to give half a minute for each presenters to say the last one sentence. Over to you, Dennis, Dr. Dennis. Thank you very much. I, I would say invest in teachers, invest in teaching and learning resources. We can only achieve this by investing in education overall and earmarking some of the investments to teachers. Thank you very much. Beautiful, thank you very much. Mary Sam, please. Invest in uh, STEM education and uh, establish model STEM schools to demonstrate the kind of resources required for STEM education. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you very much. Tamachan. Thank you very much. Uh, we are living in a digital world, so invest on online and digital learning and also through sort of quality uh, design and development of materials. And uh, the parents, uh, should be part of this digital world because when children are given the uh, the access 
they might be going in different direction and many parents are complaining. Also, that has to be monitored very well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dennis, Mary, um, and Tamachen. I don't have any words to add. Let us invest in teachers and let us invest in education through teaching, learning, uh, materials and resources and more. I would like to thank the organizers, APSEO and uh, Korean government for an excellent opportunity given to us. Thank you very much.